Hi, I'm Mitch Zuckley and I'm the chairman at ORC. Can you guys hear me okay? Jared, can you hear me well? Okay, great. We are deeply honored uh, to have all of our lawyers, our legal professionals, our clients and friends with us today for this Juneteenth 2020 conversation. Obviously, this is a moment in which the conversation is incredibly timely. I hope that we'll look back at this moment as a turning point in our history, when we as a firm and as a profession and as a society uh, began a long overdue journey collectively to ensure that Black lives matter and thrive in our country and our communities. Over the past several weeks, the Black lawyers at ORIC, or BLUE as we call them, have helped us plan this uh, journey. And we began by announcing five ORIC racial justice fellowships last week. Today, we take another step in what we know is a marathon. Uh, and we could not have a more authentic or fact-based and more empowering voice to help guide us through that than our guest Soledad O'Brien. Soledad, thank you so much for being with us in our community on this historic day. Uh, Thurgood Marshall observed that all of us, black, brown, white, all of us, got where we are today because someone bent down and helped us and picked us up by our boots. And that is, of course, incredibly true. And it's also quite relevant to today's speaker. Soledad and her husband, Brad, did exactly that for an incredibly important work lawyer and one of our co-leaders of Blue, Tiara Pens, through their scholarship foundation and with a lot of love. In that moment, or in a moment, Tiara's gonna to talk to us about the remarkable impact that had for her. But I'd just like to say on behalf of all of us at ORIC, Soledad, we're incredibly grateful you did that. We at ORIC are incredibly fortunate that it led Tiara to ORIC and we would be a much weaker organization without her creativity, her hard work, her dedication, and her wisdom. So thank you enormously for helping create the path that brought Tiara to us. Last week, Dr. Aaron Reeves coached us that our journey begins by listening to what it's like to be in someone else's shoes. And we, of course, all need to do that as allies with genuine curiosity because we want ourselves to have a more inclusive firm a more inclusive profession, and a more inclusive society. And we've been doing a lot of that listening, uh, both here at ORIC and, and with our clients. We've heard lots of stories of pain and anger and fear and exhaustion. And those were stories that we needed to hear. We clearly know that we have work to do in our own house. We know that we have work to do in our society. And we've been deeply touched by the commitments from many of our clients to help do some of that work together. And today is a step, I think, in that direction. We'd like to take the step of, of becoming more informed. And we want to thank you, Tiara, and you, Soledad, for helping us see that path. Before we hear from Tiara, it's my honor to turn this over to Kelly Newsom, who's a white collar litigator and another co leader at Blue. So, Kelly, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Mitch. Again, my name is Kelly Newsom, and I'm an attorney in Oryx's white collar practice. And along with Eugene Clark Herrera and Tierra Pienz, I have the privilege of being one of the co-leaders of the Black Lawyers of Oric, Blue. And so Blue exists to assist with recruiting Black attorneys to Oric, to support the professional development of Black attorneys at Oric, and build relationships with our clients and friends. And today's event is just another reinforcement of that three-pronged focus. But before we jump right into today's conversation, we thought it would be appropriate to share just a little bit of history about Juneteenth. So on January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, declaring all persons held as slaves within any state forever free. However, many enslaved people did not learn about their freedom until much, much later particularly those that were living in slates held by the Confederate power. And it was two and a half years later, on June 19th, 1865, two months after the surrender of the Confederate army, that 2,000 Union troops arrived in Galveston, Texas, the most remote part of the Confederacy, and announced that the 250,000 enslaved persons living in the state of Texas were free. And that day, June 19th, is what came to be known as Juneteenth, or Emancipation Day, or Freedom Day. And today, 155 years later, 
that idea of freedom is still a relevant topic. And we want you to be a part of that conversation. During the program, we invite you to use the Q&A feature on your Zoom page to submit your questions. And at the end, we'll get to as many as we possibly can. But on behalf of the Black Lawyers of Oric, we are so grateful that you've chosen to spend part of, you, a part of this very important holiday with us. And we look forward to continuing the conversation beyond today. Tiara, it's in your hands. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you, Mitch, for your kind words. So my name is Tiara Pientz. I am an employment lawyer at ORIC, and I have the honor of introducing our very special guest and leading a conversation with her today. So as many of you already know, Soledad is an award-winning journalist. She is the winner of three Emmy Awards and a Peabody Award. She is a former CNN news anchor and is now the CEO of Starfish Media Group, which is a multi-platform media production company dedicated to telling empowering and authentic stories on a range of social issues. She is a powerful advocate for telling the true story through her own news series, Matter of Fact with Soledad O'Brien. And as Mitch just mentioned, I have the lucky fortune of calling Soledad my mentor. I met Soledad a little over 10 years ago. At the time, I was a sophomore at UCLA. In addition to being a full-time student, I was working uh, two jobs. I commuted two hours between uh, home and school. Uh, my school had just increased tuition by 33% and I was in dire need of help. Uh, this was the height of the Great Recession and I was featured on a CNN story about college students who were struggling and uh, needed some financial assistance. And a couple of days after the story aired, I received a call and it was Soledad. Soledad and her husband Brad had just uh, started a scholarship foundation and they invited me to join. Uh, that call and that invitation would profoundly change my life. Uh, through her body of work and her uh, philanthropic efforts, Soledad has changed many lives. And so it is a great honor uh, that, uh, that she agreed to join us today. And so with that, please give a virtual round of applause for our special guest, Soledad O'Brien. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. And I'm so grateful that you, uh, that you are here with us. So before we jump into the first question, I just wanted to set some context. And I'm actually going to start a couple years uh, ago. So it was November 2014. I had just found out I was pregnant with uh, my first child, my daughter, your namesake. Um, <laughs> um, and I logged on to social media one day um, and I learned that a 12 year old boy, a black boy named Tamir Rice had been murdered. Uh, he was shot uh, by the police. He was playing alone at a playground. Uh, and I remember thinking in that moment, if a 12 year old boy playing alone at a park is not safe from, from police violence, where on earth will my child be safe? And so fast forward uh, a little over five years and so many other unarmed black men and women have been murdered by the police and vigilantes. Uh, and the most recent of those, uh, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, and George Floyd. Uh, and George Floyd, I think um, for a lot of people was particularly troubling because we all watched a video where for eight minutes and 46 seconds, a police officer kneeled on a man's neck uh, and, and George Floyd begged for help uh, and eventually called out for his mother. Um, and since that moment, uh, we have seen people rise up kind of, you know, this is a, a special moment. There are protests in all 50 states. People are standing up against systemic race, racism and police violence. Uh, there are protests in over 200 cities across the U.S. There are protests in uh, dozens of countries across uh, the world. Um, and so with that context, I want to ask, you know, as you know, today is Juneteenth. Kelly just mentioned the history. Um, what does Juneteenth mean to you and what does it mean in this moment? 
So I grew up in a community, first of all, oh my gosh, how great that we're doing this. Um, yes. I remember back all those years and I have to tell you, um, when when it was you were pointed in my direction, I just remember thinking, well, if this was ever a sure thing. <laughs> and so we were honored to uh, help support you. You did 99.999996% of the work and we did a little tiny bit and, and what a blessing I mean to be in your life and and yes to get another Soledad out in the world Nora Soledad uh, is an amazing thing um, so thank you for having me when I grew up uh, I grew up in a mostly white community my mom was black uh, she passed away last year my dad was white and uh, so we were one of the very few minority families in uh, an all-white community. So when I was growing up, Juneteenth meant nothing. I'd never heard of it. It wasn't until I was a grown person and I started getting invited to Juneteenth celebrations that I began to first understand, as we heard from Kelly a minute ago, like the crazy history of Juneteenth, that, that the, the war is over and the Emancipation Proclamation has been signed uh, years earlier and still there are people who do not know that they are in fact no longer slaves. But I think for me, as I started going to these celebrations, first as a complete outsider, um, often they would start in, first in Galveston, but then in, in Texas, you know, anywhere in Texas, um, and it was a very much like a state thing, and then it kind of grew, you begin to realize that, that it was really about celebrating the end of slavery and really putting a, a point on it's over. And I think the United States has not actually had a true reckoning of kind of 400 years of enslaving people. And because of that, we don't actually have conversations in places outside of say Galveston, Texas, uh, when I was growing up, um, where people talked about how did, we never covered how did slavery end. There was the Emancipation Proclamation and that was it. And so the details about the lives of black people have never really truly been dug into or explored or examined in any real way, very frequently in white communities where I grew up, but even as a whole and as a journalist, I began to see that a lot, you know, that, that there were lots of interesting stories, but people just didn't know that they existed at all. And so it's been kind of, for me, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a point, it's a moment, it's an important historical moment, but really it's a jumping off point of, of telling stories and explaining why did it take two months? Why two and a half years from the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation? I've always been so interested in the why and understanding the stories. And also I'm so amazed and, and, and thrilled now that people, there have been Juneteenth celebrations around the country for a long time now, but that everybody's trying to understand what Juneteenth is. Um, people who've never heard of it are like, well, let me figure it out because this is a shared history. Um, American history isn't just the history of white people in America. It's a history of all of us in America who contributed in some capacity. And I think until we really understand each other's stories, we're not gonna understand how people are living. We won't understand how you feel as a mom of a child hearing about Tamir Rice. And I think that kind of being able to put yourself in other people's shoes and, and understand how they're feeling is really important to empathy and compassion, but also to this joint experience of being an American and caring for other people. So that's what it means for me. And, you know, so many people are joining us today because they want to learn more about Juneteenth and because they want to learn more about the current outcry, right, that they're, that they're seeing. And so I wanted to talk about you know, police violence and what we're seeing in the media and the protests, the people out there, the anger that they're feeling. Can you kind of share with us, you know, some of your thoughts around what's going on? Sure. And in a minute, if you'll allow me, I'm going to run a clip from a documentary we did a few years ago that looked at African-American men and police violence. Uh, but first, you know, the story of how um, policing in Black communities um, happens is a really interesting one that many people who are not in the black community uh, don't understand. I would hazard to say that almost every single African American or brown man has been stopped by the police at some point. And there was an interesting essay that I read this morning and anybody who follows me on Twitter can find it on my Twitter feed because I retweeted it. And it was about a man who was um, from Africa who talked about what it was like to come to America as a Somali refugee. And he said, you know, he just could feel this anger and he began to understand it because he realized that 
people became enraged in how they were being treated in policing because the other option was fear. And people who didn't want to be fearful became enraged. And I remember when my little brother was stopped by the police. He was going, he was a medical school student at Harvard. He was going to a party in Brooklyn. A couple of police officers um, stopped him and his two friends, made them lie on the ground, dumped out their bags, and um, went through their stuff. And then eventually realized they weren't the guy who'd knocked over the toll takers booth and they let him go. And all he was so mad. And what he was mad about was that there was no sense that he was due an apology. He's like, everybody makes mistakes, but I wasn't, we weren't even worth apologizing to, that there was a sense of like, it doesn't matter. Someone can come up and stop you and frisk you and arrest you and you're nobody. And it doesn't matter that you're, you know, I think, I think he actually thought that being a medical school student would protect him in some capacity and it, it doesn't. So it's, this issue around policing, I think, has always been a very challenging one because I think if you're not living it, you don't really understand what it's like to be stopped in your own driveway, what it's like to be stopped going to a party, what it's like. So years ago, we did a, a few years ago, we did a documentary that looked at um, a couple of young men who were um, dealing with stop and frisk in New York City, where I lived, and uh, we were very interested in seeing how those policies affected kind of the emotional state of these young guys. So if I may, I'd love to run that clip, quick clip and then we can talk about it on the other side. Take a look. Let's do it. Tell me a little bit about where we are in East New York. Um, it's referred to as Little Baghdad because of the murder rates um, and a lot of the violence that happens, and that includes with the police. So when you were beaten up, now a couple of years ago, I know it's painful for you. Do you mind walking me through that day? Um, every time I'm asked about the incident, I close my eyes and I can see myself there again. In August 2012, he saw police stop a young black man for riding his bike on the sidewalk. The routine stop suddenly turned violent. More officers started arriving onto the scene. They beat his legs, they maced him, they tased him. Why were you so interested in what's happened to this kid? Um, oh, you didn't know. Yeah. I mean, honestly, the kid could have been my brother. So I just wanted to make sure that he was all right. The police asked Luis to move away. He says he did. They yelled at me when I got right here, and they said, stop right there. Where do you think you're going? Yeah. So I stopped. Right. And I turn around. Five officers line up around me. The tallest officer, he tells me, are you some type of tough guy? And he tries to grab my left arm. So I move my left arm back. I said, there's no reason for you to touch me. So I walk away. All the officers are continuing to follow me, so I get really nervous because I could hear like the buckles and the walkie-talkies and everything. When I turn around, the tall officer punches me in the face. I hit the floor and he screams, he's resisting arrest. And then a swarm of officers from everywhere came to me. He ain't do nothing! He ain't do nothing! He ain't do nothing! Yo, yo. He ain't do nothing! He ain't do nothing! I'm screaming, why are you punching me? Why are you kneeing me? Why are you kicking me? Just take me, take me. And they just continue to assault me. They finally put cuffs on me. They finally get me up, but they're only picking me up by my wrist, which is what did the major damage to my shoulders. He ain't do nothing! Record that shit, please. Yeah, I got it. Record everything. He ain't do nothing. What would have happened if there was no video? I don't like. There wouldn't have been anything. But my word against 15 police officers. Luis's mom, Evelyn, used to trust the police, but has had a change of heart. I brought up my kids to respect police. If they had a problem, they could go to a policeman and say, "Listen, I'm lost. Can you help me get home?" The thing that bothers me the most is how can you come to someone that you can't trust? Luis was charged with disorderly conduct, resisting arrest, and obstructing a government official. All charges were dropped. Police will not respond to the allegations because Luis has filed a lawsuit against the city. 
That was one of the officers on the scene, too. <laughs> Funny enough. The police department's reforms were supposed to calm fears in minority communities, but intensive enforcement continues to exact a price. It's been two years. How come you can't get past it? Every time I'm asked about the, the incident, I close my eyes and I can see myself there again. He ain't do nothing. I can see myself on the floor getting punched, getting kneed, and asking why. Like, every day I wake up and I have aches and pains in both my arms. I'll never be the same. Tell me, uh, if anywhere, where do you feel that? It feels like my arms are going to pop. If you can tolerate it, let it stretch, because if we don't do anything, this is as far as you're going to get. Luis's recovery process has been slow. He goes to physical therapy every week to try to rehabilitate his injured shoulders. Hold on. <sighs> That's a little scary there, huh? Yeah, hold on. After the altercation, he underwent two surgeries to repair torn ligaments. He's waiting on a third. <sighs> he was once a college football player. Tell me how you're feeling when you're doing that. I'm frustrated only you're because frustrated. only yeah. because yeah. I was doing 100 reps in a set. I bet. And now I can barely do three. He's trying his best, trying to overcome this. There's still moments where you can see him and, and he's thinking far away. He's silent. You see those slight changes. You know there's more to it. Am I ever going to be 100 percent again? We all change all the time. We don't go back. You're not going to be Luis of two years ago or five years ago. You're going to be the new Luis. And it's challenging, but um, it, that's the truth. You know, I don't think um, often we hear a lot of these stories uh, about police conflicts, but we don't dig into the emotional state. In that doc, by the way, we looked at black police officers in New York City who they themselves had been stopped, uh, young college students who talked about the shame of being pushed up against the wall and have someone search your backpack while your professors are walking by. We really were trying to humanize, which is something that I think is a very universal experience for black men, certainly, and some black women that I don't think people often really talk about. And that has been, you know, it's hard to say that there has been anything, you know, is positive um, from from this moment, but I will say one thing that that I've seen happening more and more is that people are sharing their experiences, you know, with their friends, with their colleagues. We had a call um, at Oric with uh, the Black Lawyers of Oric Affinity Group and uh, Oric's leadership team. Mitch uh, participated in the call, and. It was incredibly moving because, you know, we're a bunch of black lawyers and people probably assume that these issues, you know, we're not dealing with, that people aren't being, you know, that the black partners aren't being stopped in their car, aren't being harassed. Um, you know, I have a black husband. I, I constantly worry about what he's wearing when he goes out jogging and, you know, and if he's late coming home, I'm, you know, did he get stopped? Is something going on? Um, but I think people don't realize that this happens to all of us, right? It, 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 you know, no one's immune from, from this kind of police uh, surveillance and uh, police violence and brutality. And so, you know, this definitely feels like a moment of reckoning. And I think part of it is having these conversations. And, and, and I, you know, I, I, I really appreciate your clip because Luis could be any Black back, you know, man or boy. And you know. It's interesting, years ago, uh, we, when that documentary aired, I was sitting on a, a panel, uh, to the, they call it the TCA, Television Cable um, Writers, whatever, something, Association. And they were doing a review of Black in America, my documentary series that was part of. And so at one point people were asking me, so talk about the doc and how do you pick the people in the doc and what did you learn from the doc? And one question was, what was the most surprising thing you took away? And I said, you know, it's so interesting that regardless of socioeconomic class, we were profiling a, a woman in poverty who in fact was being evicted on the day I was interviewing her. 
a, a middle class family that was dropping their kids off in college and a wealthy black family, a Hollywood star uh, living in the Hollywood Hills. And no matter what social class they were in, they all almost sounded like they were speaking off of a script when, when you'd ask them about policing, right? And it would go like this. When my son turned 13, sometimes daughter, but usually son. When my son turned 13, I told him, if you are stopped by the police, here's what you need to do. Make sure your hands are like this. Do not make any sudden movements, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so I told this group of writers that that was kind of my big takeaway, that when it came to policing, that in fact, no one was really protected from this idea, like that your class didn't protect you from the race, that there was this, this truly deeply embedded racism that was affecting people. So I get off the stage and my boss's boss's boss, a great guy who in fact had funded Black in America for nine years, which cost a gajillion dollars. And he said to me, you know, that's not true. And I was like, I just spent 18 months doing this talk. Of course it's true. And he said, no, white people feel the same way. And I said, you know, I don't think you're understanding what I'm saying. In the black community, the fear is you're going to get killed. People are telling their children how to survive. And in the white community, it's don't be a jerk. Make sure you, you know, be, be well behaved. But people aren't concerned about survival. They're not having a conversation about, I need you to live through this interaction. And he said something interesting to me. He said to me, it's just not true. Stop sharing that story. And so I did because I wanted to keep my job. And again, this guy is a great guy. And I only tell this story because I think it really shows us that all of us, him included, clearly, like have a moment where we feel very uncomfortable and, and something is butting up against how we feel about an issue. And so we just can't discuss it. And I think we're in one of these moments where it's really tricky, where this is, these are uncomfortable conversations, like the third rail of conversation. <laughs> uncomfortable for white people, uncomfortable for black people. And I think it's really important that we don't just say, so the answer is stop. <laughs> because if someone's hierarchically above you, then guess what? Yes, they'll all just stop. It won't solve the dilemma. Uh, I think it's about saying, wow, well, I see it differently. Can we have a conversation and really figure this out and at least talk about it and, and hear what somebody else has to say. I've had at least, I'd say at least well more than a dozen white middle-aged guys who've been DMing me on Twitter when they would see the George Floyd video who would say, you know, I guess I always just thought that police really only stop people for a reason. That it wasn't, you know, and, and that watching some of these videos that have been coming out that they were like, wow, I just never, I always figured there was some reason, you know, something. And I think that they, they're they really beginning to see a different side, which is almost a very different world than people who are, you know, than their black counterparts in the office are living, mm -hmm. but they never really had exposure to that. And so I do think it's a very important moment. Yeah, and I'm so glad that these conversations are happening and that there are, are, are tons of people out in the streets, you know, unapologetically saying Black Lives Matter. And so, you know, today uh, joining us on uh, this video call are um, a number of ORIC lawyers, ORIC um, professionals. But I feel also, very legally protected right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Army lawyers. But, but also, um, there are a host of our clients and friends of ORIC, and, and these include some of the top um, you know, industry leading companies in the tech sector, in uh, finance, and in energy, and many others. Uh, and a lot of them are trying to figure out as organizations, you know, what their role is, what they can do. And some may be afraid because they fear that, you know, standing up um, in, in, in defense of Black lives may be a political issue. And so, you know, I went to ask, do you think this is a political issue? And is there a role for, for businesses to, to, to play in this moment? I think it is the role actually for businesses to play. I mean, I think every business leader who you know, knows that we're in, a, we're in a vacuum when it comes to leadership politically, right? So, so I think, and, and, and I think it's, that means, and historically business leaders step up. I mean, right, if you're not leading, your company's gonna go under at some point. So business leaders, this is what they do. And businesses are, are, are full of people who've come up with great value statements and mission statements. And this is the moment, right? Where you say, we have a, a mission statement. We have a statement of our company values. I mean, 
isn't this the moment where we have to live those values? And so I've actually been incredibly impressed uh, by the number of organizations that have said, you know, we need to figure out what we need to do to show leadership on this front. And I think it's because there's this vacuum, right? That, that it, the answer can't be, we're not gonna do anything. And so, you know, it's interesting when you look at all the institutions where people have lost their faith, politics is one, I hate to say, media is another, but people actually have tremendous faith in the places they work, in, in organizations. They want to believe that their organization is going to do good things in the community. And I think organizations rec recognize that, especially if you have younger employees, they really, millennials and younger, really, really want to work in a place where they feel like they're, they have opportunities and they're being moved ahead and that they have tangible results. And so I actually think businesses are very well positioned because they're used to operating in spaces where you say you're going to do something, you know, you figure out the metrics by which you're going to measure it, and then you hold yourself accountable to those metrics, whether you're I don't know if you're selling vacuum cleaners, there's you know, like, how many do we sell? How many did we think we we're gonna sell? Did we hit our goals? Kind of simple. And so I'm seeing now a number of industries writ large, but also just individual companies within these specific industries who are saying, well, what can we do? I mean, we've talked about wanting to have more African-Americans in our leadership, but when we look, we really haven't moved the needle over 15, 20 years. So what do we have to do and how do we now really, really do it? And so I've actually been quite impressed. I mean, obviously the proof is in the pudding, but in the conversations that are being had, they're not, here's our slogan and here's the ad we're gonna take out and we think all of this is gonna pass by next Friday, so we're good. I, th I think people are really trying to restructure what does change look like within their own organization and how do you hold yourself accountable? I, I do a show, um, a, a policy show called Matter of Fact and one of the things we did we wanted to do a show that was a genuinely diverse show. It's We co-produce it with Hearst and uh, it's like a Sunday morning show. And we started tracking the number of people of color we had on the air because we talked about how we would do that, but there was no measurable way to do it. So we were like, all right, well, we'll just every show count. I mean, if we're doing something on Native Americans, then we should have Native Americans. Like, and this is not brain surgery. You know? If we're doing something on millennials, there should be millennials. And, and we would decided we would only put experts on and that we'd also track. And to the point where people would make fun of me and they'd say like, what do you, you count all the black people? I'm like, yes, actually, yes, I do. I mean, if it's our mission, if we have decided it's important to us to do a show that is diverse, then yes, we will count all the black people if that's what it takes to make sure that we're doing the thing that we set out to do. I'm just making sure I'm being accountable to what I told everybody I was gonna do. And it's, it, you know, it's not that hard. It's just about really deciding you're going to live your values. What are your values? Now go do it. And so I've actually been very impressed because there are lots of conversations like this happening and in a lot of organizations, some that I've been privy to, some many, many, obviously more that I haven't been, where you can just tell people are trying to figure it out and they recognize that there's a problem. And if it's not gonna be solved by um, political leadership stepping up and really leading by example, then they'll they'll have to step up. And so I think that's a good thing. Yeah, and, and, and so, you know, this convers the this conversation our na our national conversation you know even global conversation right has definitely um, shifted from you know first we're talking about Black Lives Matter and police violence but you know there's also now a kind of a new awakening that there are many ways that systemic racism plagues um, our society right it, it, it you know it's evident in police violence and the way policing happens, but it's also evident in, you know, the various institutions that we belong to, our workplaces. So, you know, as you know, I'm an employment lawyer at ORG, and um, I've been very encouraged uh, because a lot of our clients have been reaching out and asking, hey, can you take a, a, help us take a second look at our diversity and inclusion initiatives? You know, we, you know, we want to audit what we're doing, figure out how we can do them better, you know, from, from an employment law perspective, what else could we be doing uh, to move the needle? And much of that, by the way, is often being pushed by the Black employees inside the company, right? This is why it matters that you have people around the table who have the voice and who use that voice to stand up and say, actually, 
let us help you get to where we all as an organization want to want to be. You know, people don't talk enough about systemic racism. I mean, it sounds like a boring lecture topic in a lot of ways, but I often will tell people, I, I grew up in Long Island and um, and when we would cut out of high school, we would go to Robert Moses State Park. And Robert Moses State Park was kind of this drive, maybe like a 45 minutes to an hour. But one of the, the things across Robert Moses State Park were these overpasses and they were relatively low, only cars could go underneath them. And it was very intentional. Robert Moses wanted to make sure that black and brown people from New York City did not come to his beaches in Long Island. And so he made low overpasses in order that the buses wouldn't fit. And I often tell that story when I'm talking about systemic racism, because I think the job of a journalist, right, is to take a, a wonky topic and, and turn it into a narrative, right? Like systemic racism is somebody deciding to intentionally make overpasses too low for you kind of people to come through. Mm -hmm. And there's a million stories like that. And so I am, I am very encouraged that people are trying to say, okay, well, how do we dismantle some of these things? Systemic racism is all of those things, as you point out, right? It's policing, it's how we think about hiring. A lot of times, listen, I have been in a million meetings where someone would say, listen, they can apply, but we've already picked the person, but we need a diverse slate, so they should apply and we're gonna, you know. So sometimes diverse slate isn't good enough because there's lots of ways around that. I think you can't get to solutions until you have people really willing to sit around a table and say, we actually want real solutions. We want to help figure this out, not just for our organization, but because it makes the country better. And I think we're at this pivotal moment. I think it's a really important time. Yeah, absolutely. And so here at ORIC, we've been having this conversation um, and I've you know, been very proud of ORIC and proud that I work at such an awesome firm because they've really invited um, uh, all of us to be a part of the conversation and figuring out what the organization would do. And so as Mitch mentioned, um, ORIC is funding at least five uh, racial justice fellowships. And so ORIC lawyers will have the opportunity for one year uh, to participate in, um, in a fellowship where they can make a, a, an impact. Um, and ORC has rolled out several other initiatives, um, uh, but it continues to be an open dialogue. And, and I think that's a very important model. Um, and, and I would encourage other organizations to, to, to do that as well, right? Listen to your people, figure out, you know, are the values that you profess truly your values and how can you live by them? There's so, a, they're tough conversations, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's in fact, when you guys had lunch um, uh, at uh, my husband's company, I remember he said to me, you know, um, everyone, no one wants to really talk about, I think it must have been the Eric Garner killing. It was right around that time. Mm -hmm. And he was sort of like, well, you know, that would be so inappropriate to have people come and talk about that. And I was like, oh, no. And I remember at that luncheon, it's all our young scholars wanted to talk about because one, I think the, this generation is different. And I think, you know, he felt like, well, isn't it terrible to bring your personal um, things you're feeling personally to work? And I was like, this is a different group and this is what they're feeling and it overtakes their life. So you have to have this conversation at work. And it really changed how they thought about, well, maybe we need to do more of these conversations at work. But again, I don't think anybody was thinking we shouldn't do this for some you know, uh, evil purpose, I think it was a sense of, it's much more respectful of the girls if we just don't talk about it. Meanwhile, all you, you were girls at the time, marched in and were like, we need to discuss this issue. And so it was resolved in about 10 seconds, regardless of all the planning, which was, which was good. I, I think a lot of organizations are feeling that now, like your employees, black and white and other are all being affected. So you, you actually need to figure out how to have some of these conversations because they're going to happen anyway. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, when we spoke last uh, on Tuesday, you mentioned um, you mentioned uh, a story about Brad that you know he he would feel very frustrated when he would show up to speak uh, on a panel uh, as an expert, and he would look to his left and right only to realize that there were only other white men participate. I was going to say, we should tell you, my husband's a middle-aged white guy. So, uh, uh, yeah, you know, it's so interesting. And uh, I very rarely talk about Brad because he hates it. So now I'm talking about him twice. But um, uh, 
he used to tell people uh, that I, I spoke so little about him in my in my talks that he's like, people don't even know that you sound like you're a single mom, you know, like I'm not even in the picture. But he did, he was talking about, you know, how do you, in a panel that you're not managing, mm -hmm. that you just say yes to, you know, you get there and then all of a sudden you realize you're on a mantle and it's a white mantle. And how do you, in fact, leverage your power? And I think there's great, it, it, there are great analogies for whether you're talking about staffing a, a panel or anything else, right? And I said, <laughs> literally, I said, uh, you know, you need to do this like Mariah Carey and Patti LaBelle, right? Which is, you know, Mariah Carey doesn't go and join something until she knows exactly who else is going to be a diva in this, you know, in this special. And Patti LaBelle has been doing this for a minute. You know, she doesn't do that either, right? They sit there and they say, well, I'd love to do this. However, what I'm going to need is, right? And that can be, I'd love to do this. I'm going to hold the date. What I'm going to need is, I'd like a panel that has half women. I'd like a panel that has, you know, half people of color. I'd like a panel that has a lots of young female people of color. And so I think you have a leverage moment. And when someone, and you say, come back to me. When you've booked that panel, come back to me and we'll confirm. And it gives you that power of your position, right? You can ask for things in that moment and you can help move the needle of a thing you're not actually in charge of. And so I see that in so many ways, right? Imagine if every single writer, uh, every single actor in Hollywood said, listen, my writing team has to be diverse. I'd love to, I would love to do this show, a multi-part series on Netflix, fantastic. We need to have at least XX percent diversity. Right. And at that big star smiles and says, when, when that happens, you send that contract to my agent and we'll be good. And you have a moment of doing that. And until people start, demand is almost too strong. It's like, just put it out there as something you're going to need, something that's important to you. Um, and when it's important to you and you signal to everybody, yes, I'm a white middle-aged dude. And what's important to me is I want to see younger people on this panel. I need to see women on this panel and I need to see black people on this panel. Uh, if that's what's important to you and then you can live your values. But if you just say, yeah, well, I didn't book this panel. You shouldn't be surprised when it ends up being a male. And I, I think trying to get people to leverage the power that they have to make the change they want to see. It's, it's pretty easy to do actually. And I think that I, I just really love that story because a lot of people are wondering right now, what can I do personally? Like, you know, what is my role? They're upset, they're frustrated, they wanna support, they wanna be allies. Um, and I think that's just an incredible example. You know, you kind of show up and you say, hey, would love to do it, but this is what I need. And, and, and you're right, I think it's transferable in so many other kind of situations that the professionals um, are in, and especially uh, those, uh, uh, those individuals who are on this call. Um, and so, yeah, so, so I love that. Yeah, there's lots that individuals can do, right? I mean, sometimes uh, I've been in many a meeting when, you know, I'll be talking about something that's around race or around, you know, gender issue. And people really only take it seriously when a white guy says, wow, I find that really interesting. When white men said, God, I'd watch Black in America, the entire tone of the room changed, right? All they were saying was, that sounds interesting. I, that sounds like good storytelling. I'd watch that. But it made everybody feel like, oh, okay, this is going to be okay. And so imagine really leveraging that power of saying, I think this person has a good idea. I think this person should be given a shot. I think we should hire 10 more interns. I think we should hold ourselves to 80% diverse interns this year to make up for no diversity last year. I think, you know, I mean, just kind of weighing in on issues is hugely, hugely important. And I, I, think, um, I think you can really move the needle that way. Absolutely. And I think it's fundamentally right about courage, um, about courage to kind of stand up and, um, and when you see something that, you know, you don't like, or you see something that could be better, right? Just saying something about it. Yeah. And, and sometimes I think it's even almost courage sounds too strong. It's just about, I don't think advocacy requires so much courage. I think it's just doing what you would do for your own kid, right? You'd stand up and say, Hey, listen, let's give this person a shot. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's recognizing that you, you have power mm -hmm. in that moment, right? And so how are you going to use your power to do those things that you say are important values of yours? 
Um, it, I, sometimes I just think it's a recognizing. I really, I mean, I think for uh, for the 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 panel conversation it was just like you have power, use it. <laughs> yes. So we have about ten more minutes, uh, and I wanted to jump to some questions from the audience. And so a couple of people have have um, have submitted some questions. Um, and so the first one. Um, um, was uh, what is the name of your documentary and where can people watch it? So oh, it's sure. That you it's do. called the documentary that's about to air. Uh, it airs tonight on her stations and then on Wednesday on the her stations that are ABC affiliated. Uh, and then it'll air on PBS next month. Uh, it's called Outbreak, the first response. And it looks at um, how Seattle responded uh, at a time of crisis when they were already dealing with people in crisis, people in nursing homes, people who are homeless, um, what happened when coronavirus hit as well. It's a really fantastic doc. So it airs tonight on her stations that are NBC and CBS stations, and then the her stations that are ABC stations on Wednesday. But if you check your local listings, you can see it. Sounds good. I'm looking forward to watching it. Thank you. Second question is, you are a journalist. Many have lost faith in the media. Uh, but media is critical. What is the solution? How do we regain faith? I think it's a great question. It's a fantastic question. And I think, um, I think the only way to regain faith, whether you're the media or anybody, right? You can't talk about, listen, trust me. The kind of person who says, trust me, you never trust. You just have to do things that are trustworthy. I think the media needs to be camped out, again, fulfilling its values statement, right? We're supposed to be elevating facts, elevating truth, and making sure that we're serving our community. It's not a super complicated mission statement. I personally believe that when we set up debates in the media, very typical in cable, this person over here on the left or the far left, this person over here on the right or the far right, and we set them up to argue that you now create a world in which everybody is this versus this. Listen, I get it, the high drama, high conflict, it has all the elements of you know good TV. The show we do, for a matter of fact, actually, we decided not to do any of that. I, I never had, you know, lawmakers screaming at each other. One, I, I think it's very unseemly, and I hate it. I hate getting information that way, at like, ugh, in the morning. So we'll look at the housing crisis and just tell stories. It's it's much more expensive to go and and shoot the story of somebody. In our case, we did a guy who lived in San Diego, who moved to Mexico where he was able to afford an apartment and he reverse commutes. He comes in from Mexico every day to his job. He's not Mexican, he's American, uh, and comes in uh, to San Diego for his job because he can't afford housing in San Diego. And that's a very typical story uh, around the country. I have no idea what his political leanings are. It's irrelevant for our story or, or the woman who she's from actually not too far where I grew up in Long Island. Her daughter uh, needs insulin. And, and so she, you know, she's dipping now into her savings to pay for her daughter's insulin. Her daughter has a job, but she's working in philanthropy. She doesn't make a lot of money. I, I don't know. I mean, I, she's from a conservative part of Long Island. So I, I bet I don't know. I mean, we're not talking like it's not politics. It's about how policies can serve people, all people. It doesn't really matter what side of the aisle they're on. And so I just think there's so many better ways. But if you, if you, what do they always say? If you give everybody a hammer, then every issue is a nail. You know, like you just, you're going to look, if everything is this person versus this person, then every issue is going to be this versus this versus, well, how do we solve this problem? All of us. And so I think that's a real flaw in journalism. And until they fix that, I think it's very hard. You'll upset a lot of people and you'll make them anxious because that's kind of the goal. But I don't think you do a good job reporting and bringing and elevating facts and truth and data and science uh, I don't think you really do that. So I understand why people have lost faith. I really get it. One thing that I love about um, you as a journalist and I love about your Twitter feed is that you don't shy away from calling out your colleagues in the media when they um, uh, put forward biased reporting. Um, and I think it's just such an incredible skill and talent and, you know, and, and I think it, it does take courage and I, and I wish that more people would do that in their own professions. It's funny, the younger reporters do a better job adding context to the tweets. They know how to communicate over social media. It's the older reporters who just sort of um, quote the president or anybody, candidates, um, of something that's factually untrue and then, and then elevate it. You're sort of like, so you've just taken a lie 
the moon is made of cheese and you've elevated a lie on your own feed and you're a reporter for a national organization. That's just wrong and it's a bad way to do it. It's so interesting to watch the younger reporters also on national platforms who say, this is the quote, here's the context, here's the fact check. I mean, it's, it's, they're just much more native and, and they do a better job serving the public, frankly, because I think it doesn't serve anybody to post something that's a verifiable lie that's not true. And so you're talking about your, you know, your role as a journalist in the media, but it actually reminds me um, of a statement that Mitch uh, released a couple of weeks ago after George Floyd's uh, death. And it was about how lawyers and legal professionals have taken an oath, right, and have some obligation, right, to uphold the Constitution, to uphold justice. And, you know, I kind of think about my role as a lawyer, even, you know, even though I practice employment law, it's, you know, it's not necessarily re related to the criminal justice system. There's still an oath, right, that I took and, and that's important. And I think I similarly, you know, we all lawyers have this obligation to kind of stand up and call things out and, 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 and make sure that, um, you know, that, that our profession is, is, um, you know, is that we're upholding our duty to our profession. And a lot of professions, right? I think right now nurses and doctors are saying, we go to work and we try to save people in, even in a pandemic, right? And bus drivers say, we do our best to get people, all people, to where they need to go fairly and, and with reserving judgment on anybody. And, and so, you know, I think like that's the pinnacle of any job that you had that, that has elements of a calling. That's why you're doing it. You feel like you're contributing to the greater world and, and everybody can, right? You just say, this is what we believe. This is why we're doing this. And how do we make sure that we're doing it and applying it justly, which is really, you know, what the constitution as flawed as it has been at times, um, has, has been able to do. And so I, I think it's, it's an amazing document to remind people like, you know, we're moving toward this more perfect union. We get to try to figure it out and we get to try to figure it out together. Absolutely. So we um, have only a couple more minutes and we have so many good questions. I think we'll hit one more and then I'll turn it back over to Mitch for closing. Um, so, so, and this one is a big question. Um, it is, how do we make other people care how do we encourage our friends and employers to understand the importance of diversity? I think you always have to have a business case for diversity. There was a day when, you know, it's just good to do and it feels good and it's right. And that's just not going to work. Right. I don't, those are the things that always get for my business, get canceled first, mm -hmm. you know, because people don't care about the thing that is, is good to do it needs to be money-making. And every time I approach the documentary, Black in America, Latino in America, Muslim in America, gay in America, I was always like, we're gonna win, <laughs> we're gonna win, we're gonna do a great job, we're gonna do great storytelling, and we're gonna win. Because I need to be able to say, this was an important project, but also it won, and see what that tells you about when we expand storytelling in our community. So I think it's as simple as that. It's not about making people feel good. It's about saying, you know, you spent a lot of money training these lawyers. Do you really want them to leave year three? Don't you wanna sit down and ask the black female lawyers, why are you not staying? Don't you wanna figure out why employee over here in this tech company is unhappy? Uh, there's such a, a business case for diversity. The public schools are now overwhelmingly diverse. America is becoming more diverse. So. If you want to have a successful business, you need to actually figure out how to serve people in the community who are more and more diverse and how to hire people from the community who are more and more diverse. It's just math. And if you don't do that, you're not going to be able to have a, a viable business over a long time. It's going to be problematic. So I think there's a really good business case for diversity. And it's the world we live in. Yeah. It's the world we live in today. So, you know, but that's what I always try to do in my docs, say everything I do makes money. It makes money for this company and it grows the value for this company. And that's why you should fund it because it's worth money to the bottom line. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Soledad. I cannot begin. It's so weird that you're interviewing me. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, know, right? uh, I, you know, you know how much, uh, how grateful I am to you for everything. And I, you know, now I have one more thing to be grateful for. Thank you. You were a sure thing. You had, nope, you, let me tell you, I have you to be grateful to because you were a sure thing. I literally said, 
here's a sure thing. We put a little money into our sure thing and she's become a complete rock star. So I look very good by association, but you have been a home run. So congratulations to you. And thank you for having me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Soledad. Yeah. And so now I turn it back over to you, Mitch. Thank you so much, Tara. And Soledad, thank you. I mean, this has been an incredible conversation. I know that we have lots of unanswered questions still, so hopefully we'll find a mechanism to continue that dialogue. But we cannot begin to express our gratitude to each of you, to Kelly, and to the more than 1,500 people who have been participating and watching this. Uh, a few quick takeaways. If you would like to share this conversation with your colleagues, your friends, your family, we're going to post it on our website soon, so please feel, feel free to do that. Secondly, we would like to make this a, an annual tradition. Uh, so please consider this a formal invitation for all of you who are out there to join us on our next Juneteenth conversation led by our Black Lawyers uh, of Aura. Third, please uh, make sure to tune in uh, tonight to Outbreak. And if you have interest in learning more uh, about Soledad's foundation, we will absolutely get that information uh, to you. Finally, I think all of us want this conversation to be an inflection point for us, to be a moment uh, to take the conversation to something that's uh, an action, a concrete action. And if the 1,500 or more of us that are on this uh, conversation today do one small thing, it will be impactful. All of us who are here at ORIC really would love to find ways to partner with those of you who are interested in taking a concrete action. So please reach out to us. Please reach out to whatever contact you have in the organization or to Dwayne Hughes, who's our managing director for inclusion and move the needle, or to Siobhan Hanley, who's our chief talent officer, to Renee Kathawala, who leads our pro bono efforts, or to me. We would all love to partner with you and to make sure that we're doing something concrete to address social justice and to make progress together in the spirit of Juneteenth. So thank you enormously. Couldn't be more grateful. Look forward to continuing the dialogue and look forward to working together to make progress. One last time, Soledad, Tiara, thank you very much. We look forward to talking to all of you soon. Take care.